reading from Romans chapter 2, verses 5 through 11. Romans 2, 5 through 11. But because of your stubbornness and your unrepentant heart, you are storing up wrath against yourself for the day of God's wrath, when His righteous judgment will be revealed. God will repay each person according to what they have done. To those who by persistence in doing good seek glory, honor, and immortality, He will give eternal life. But for those who are self-seeking and who reject the truth and follow evil, there will be wrath and anger. There will be trouble and distress for every human being who does evil, first for the Jew, then for the Gentile, but glory, honor, and peace for everyone who does good, first for the Jew, then for the Gentile, for God does not show favoritism. I guess it's human nature for us to have our favorites, favorite foods, favorite movies, favorite books, favorite churches, favorite vacation spots, favorite people. 
It's human nature. That doesn't mean that living as people with fav- uh, that have favorites is always a good thing and always something to let go. Sometimes favoritism can be destructive, can be bad. Thankfully, we serve a God who doesn't play favorites. We serve a God who loves us all, whether we're lovable or not. Let's pray together. We thank you, Father, for your great love for us. We thank you that that love is for us and given to us generously despite sometimes our own actions and our thoughts and our words and our failings and our sins. We thank you, Father, that when we were sinners, Christ died for us. We thank you that you refuse to show favoritism to your people. That you love all of your creation, all you have made. We pray, Father, that you'll help us to love more widely and without such partiality. We pray in Jesus' name, amen. If we're being honest, don't we play favorites? I know we don't like to admit it. I know we don't like to think about it, but don't we play favorites sometimes? As I, as we throw up some, some pictures here, you're going you're, you're gonna, to, I think see someone in these pairs of photos that you're more likely to trust, to believe, to favor, whether it's based on race, approached by a black man or a a white man on a sidewalk at night. There's one race or the other you'll probably favor more, and it's likely that white man. Maybe maybe if a realtor pulled up to your house in a, a, a car that is, is a beautiful, late model, expensive automobile, or, or pulled up in a, a run-down, ragged, older car, maybe you'd see them differently. Maybe you'd... Maybe you'd act differently toward them. Maybe you'd as- assume different things and, and expect different things from them. Sometimes it's gender. Sometimes it's age. Sometimes it's education level. Maybe it's political affiliation. Someone in these photos that you've been looking at you're more likely to trust. You're more likely to believe. You're more likely to favor. I can remember a few times when I was speaking to an audience that included somebody who was well-known or somebody who had a a good reputation in, 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 in our circles, someone who was particularly known and, and particularly respected. And I remember feeling differently about those those times, wanting to impress, wanting to to say something that really, really went to their hearts, that really made them think, what a good speaker this guy is. Chances are, There are ways in which you play favorites in your life, too. We've been talking about attributes of God, and and today we're going to talk about the fact that God is impartial. Peter says it this way in 1 Peter 1, 17, Since you call on a father who judges each person's work impartially, live out your time as foreigners here, in reverent fear. Peter says God judges each person's work impartially, without favoritism. The word literally means without lifting the face. 
The picture is somebody who's bowing down in front of a, an important person, a powerful person, and, and that powerful person reaches down and, and lifts the face of his favorite so that they can look at each other, see each other. And the fact is that we see the faces of some and not others. Sometimes those faces are attractive to us and impressive and others, others we don't see. And because we don't see their faces, we can put all our assumptions and prejudices on them. But God doesn't play favorites. He doesn't judge by outward appearances. Maybe you remember the story of the selection of David as king of the next king of Israel. Samuel is sent to the house of David's father, and David's brothers are all assembled in front of him. And Samuel keeps saying, well, this must be the guy, this first brother, this oldest brother, this second oldest brother, one of these guys, surely, and he goes down through the brothers because, you know, the oldest looks like a king. And then here comes David, and he's young, and he doesn't look like a king. And God says, but I judge by the heart. I don't look at the face. I don't look at the outward appearance that everybody else looks at. I look at the heart. The book of Deuteronomy, the Bible says, For the Lord your God is God of gods and Lord of lords, the great God, mighty and awesome, who shows no partiality and accepts no bribes. Job says it this way, Is he not the one who says to kings, You're worthless, and to nobles, You're wicked, who shows no partiality to princes and does not favor the rich over the poor, for they are all the work of his hands. Celebrity, wealth, skin color, job, education, religiousness, God doesn't care about the differences that matter so much to us. We're all the work of his hands. The CEO in a corner office in the loop and the guy begging for change on a street corner. We're all the work of his hands. Those two and everybody in between. God is impartial. God sees faces, but He doesn't judge by what He sees there. He doesn't judge by appearances. He doesn't judge by what's on the outside. He doesn't judge by the things that we so often judge by. When you think about it, the gospel itself is all about the fact that God is impartial. We read today from Romans chapter 2, verses 5 through 11. I want to draw your attention back to that, that text, Romans 2, 5 through 11. It's a text that starts in a, an unpleasant way. Paul talks about the stubbornness and unrepentance of our hearts. How by being stubborn and unrepentant, we're storing up wrath for ourselves when God comes in judgment. He assures us God will repay each person according to what they have done. To those who by persistence in doing good seek glory, honor, and immortality, He'll give eternal life. But for those who are self-seeking and who reject the truth and follow evil, there will be wrath and anger, trouble and distress for every human being who does evil, but glory, honor, and peace for everyone who does good. And we ask the question as we read that, but what about grace? Isn't there grace? What about forgiveness? Forgiveness Doesn't God forgive? And, and sure, absolutely. Paul's point here, though, is that God doesn't care who you are. <laughs> doesn't matter to God who you are. That's, that's the reason Paul uses that recurring phrase here for the Jew first and also for the Gentile. Doesn't matter which of those you are. 
Chapter 1 of Romans has been about those who don't recognize God at all, don't, don't see Him and don't know that He exists. And Paul says there's judgment for them. And, but then he turns his attention to those who believe in God, those who put their faith in Him, those who are, are living in a covenant with this God. He says that that doesn't impress God either. There are some who persistently do good, both Jew and Gentile, he says. Others who reject the truth, both Jew and Gentile, intentionally start categories that he uses to make the point. Whoever they might be, whatever others might think of them, or whatever they might say about themselves, God only sees what they've done. He doesn't play favorites, not even with Jews over Gentiles. His covenant people, Paul says, and Paul was one of them. The people that he called out of Egypt, the people that he made a nation. Paul says he won't even play favorites with them. God does not show favoritism. And it's easy for insiders like believers, like Christians, like church people, it's easy for us to look down on outsiders, whether it's Jewishness or churchiness or whatever, that's the criteria. Paul says God will judge each according to their deeds. He'll go on to say at the end of this chapter, circumcision, which represents kind of all of the the commandments that, that Jews were required to keep. Paul says circumcision has value if you observe the law. If it's just a formality, it's just kind of checking off a box, then what good is it? It doesn't make you God's favorite. It doesn't put you in the category of God's favorites if you don't care enough to observe the law in the other aspects of your life. But let's make it more understandable for us. What if Paul had said this, baptism has value if you live like a Christian? Baptism's important to us. It matters a lot, right? We believe it's an important step in our, our walk with the Lord. But if it's just a formality, if it's just checking off a box, it does not make us God's favorites. God doesn't care if we're wet, if we've been dunked. If we don't live like followers of Jesus, we don't get to brag about being God's favorites. And that's sometimes what I hear from Christians and sometimes the, the tendency I confront in myself that, that we can kind of think that because we're, we're Christians that somehow, somehow we're God's favorites. Paul will say in the next chapter, of Romans chapter 3, verses 22 and 24, there is no difference between Jew and Gentile, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God, and all are justified freely by His grace through the redemption that came by Christ Jesus. No difference between Jew and Gentile. We don't have a problem with that. But if Paul had said there's no difference between Christian and and non-Christian, we might struggle a little bit. Paul's point is not that Christianity doesn't matter or that all religions are as as good as, as the other. What he's saying is that grace, life, forgiveness, it doesn't come because we're God's favorites. It comes through Jesus. The gospel is for everyone who will believe. Judgment is based on whether your life reflects imperfectly as it will your trust in, your faith in, your belief in Jesus. There is no difference, Paul says. There's no Christian exceptionalism. We're not better. And if our lives look no different than those who don't know Jesus, then why would we expect that God would prefer us to them? There's no reason to expect that. There's no reason to imagine that we're God's favorites. 
God doesn't have favorites. God doesn't show favoritism. We all stand before Him in need of Jesus. We all rely on His grace. We all please Him in the same way by living as followers of Christ. So why do we behave as though God has favorites? We need Jesus, just like the folks we tend to look down on. Racists or or rioters, blacks or Asians or whites or Latinos, educated people are those who are proud of their ignorance. Women or men. Catholics, Baptists, atheists, Republicans, or Democrats, gay or transgender, church attenders and not, Sox fans or Cubs fans. You you get it, right? We tend to to to, to, to show favoritism towards some people and tend to look down on others. We tend in our lives to to understand those who are most like us and reject and hold at arm's length those who, who are a little different. We don't try to understand some as well as we try to understand others. And we behave toward certain people based on that favoritism. But God doesn't. The people we so easily demonize, God loves. The people we can't understand in a million years and don't want to try, God cares for them. He cares for them just like He cares for us. The people that impress us don't impress Him so much. The people that we mock and ridicule may just be the people who God lifts up. Our favoritism causes us to show a distinct lack of love in our lives. But God loves all of us. In Acts chapter 10, Peter is confronted a with, with a Gentile who, who loves God, who wants to hear the, the gospel of Jesus, who invites Peter into his home to hear it. God signifies through the Holy Spirit that, that he's accepted this man and accepted his faith and accepted his, his love for, for the Lord. And Peter says, I now realize how true it is that God doesn't show favoritism, but accepts those from every nation who fear Him and do what is right. Christians ought to be the most tolerant people in the world because we know that none of us are righteous, that we've all sinned, and yet that God loves us all and has made His love known to all of us and His grace available to all of us through Jesus. If God has no favorites, we need to confront our own sins of partiality. We need to confront the favoritism in our own lives. It's all through the Bible. It's all through Scripture. In the book of Leviticus 19, for example, do not pervert justice, do not show partiality to the poor or favoritism to the great, but judge your neighbor fairly. We're sort of used to seeing Bible verses about taking care of the poor. But in Leviticus, we're cautioned not even to to show favoritism to the poor. Judge your neighbor fairly. Treat those around you 
with equity. That doesn't mean the poor don't sometimes need something extra, need sort of a, a helping hand up, and that's all through Scripture as well. But the point is, you don't look at great or small, rich or poor, black or white, male or female, old or young, educated or uneducated. You don't look at either of those categories and treat them with favoritism. We're supposed to behave toward one another the way God behaves toward us, with love for all, with care for all, concern and respect for all. In James chapter 2, James asks the church to which he's writing to, to think about a, a situation that might come up. He says, Believers in our glorious Lord Jesus Christ must not show favoritism. This is James 2, chapter, uh, James chapter 2, verse 1. Verse 2 says, Suppose a man comes into your meeting wearing a gold ring and fine clothes, and a poor man in filthy old clothes also comes in. If you show special attention to the man wearing fine clothes and say, Here's a good seat for you, but say to the poor man, You stand there or sit on the floor by my feet. Have you not discriminated among yourselves and become judges? with evil thoughts. He goes on to say, look, God has chosen the poor, but you've dishonored them with your favoritism. What forms does favoritism take in our lives? What forms does it take in our churches? What forms does favoritism take in our workplaces, in our schools? The schools can be a traumatic place for for some students because, because of favoritism. They don't look the right way. They don't dress the right way. They don't speak the right way. They don't act the right way. They don't wear their hair the right way, whatever. And, and they're not the favorites. And they're held at arm's length, treated badly. But unfortunately, we don't grow up very well. We don't grow out of it. And in our offices and in our churches and, and other walks of our lives, we can treat people with the same kind of partiality and favoritism. And we've got to ask, what forms does that take? Whose faces do we lift up? Who do we fail to look in the eye? Are there people in our lives whose faces we don't see because we've already made up our minds about them? We know who they are. We know what they are. We, we know. We know. And so we heap all of our abuses on them and we, 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 we make them carry all our prejudices and carry the weight of all our previous experiences and the things we've been taught and the things we've, we've learned and the things that have just sort of, sort of marinated in through our lives. And we treat them with dishonor and disrespect and callousness and coldness and harshness. And yet maybe, maybe they're the ones that God especially wants lifted up. Maybe they're the very people that God would especially want us to lift their faces so they can see and look so we can see them. So we can share the love of God with them in our lives. I suppose how you'll take all this depends on whether you've considered yourself one of God's favorites or not. If you're not taking it well, you might want to ask yourself, what about it bothers you? Is it that God won't confirm our prejudices? That bothers us sometimes. Is it that the gospel will challenge whatever ways that we're playing favorites? Is it that God's impartiality will always make our bigotry and hatred feel small and constricting? As in a moment we share the Lord's Supper together, 
Let's ask ourselves, who might we be sharing the Lord's Supper with this morning in, in our own circles and, and, and throughout the world? Who might we be sharing communion with this morning that we, that we look down on? In what ways might we even take our favoritism with us to the Lord's table? In what ways do we need to let go of favoritism in our lives? Who are the people we need to let go of favoritism toward? How can we show more consistently the love of an impartial God who, who shows His love and grace to everyone? How can we receive more consistently, even when we're unlovable? How can we receive the love of God more consistently and more graciously and more enthusiastically? Father, help us to receive that love that you offer us. Help us to believe that we have value, that we matter. And please help us to believe that all people matter, and have value. Help us not to show undue favoritism toward anyone in our lives, and, and help us, please, Lord, not to discriminate against others. Help us to show your love, your grace, without favor, without partiality. And may we be known as people who give everyone respect and love and grace. May our churches be known as places where everyone receives respect and love and grace as creations of yours. We thank you, Father, that your impartiality is shown to us most uniquely and most beautifully in Jesus. Thank you for his death for all of us. We pray in his name. Amen.